you. Good afternoon, Chairman Solis, uh, members of the committee and staff. Um, I've been asked to address the issue of Breeze implementation. Uh, specifically, you want to know the status of Breeze and whether or not we have any maintenance needs. Has the board been able to resume normal um, function now that Breeze is live um, for our two boards? So we went live on January 19th. Um, we are part of the R2 boards that launched on that date. While much time was spent pre-go live on business functionality, um, cleaning up old data, transitioning to the new system and training staff, the board still continues to experience some challenges with the functionality of Breeze. Um, we're experiencing issues related to data that didn't convert uh, appropriately, as well as understanding and adapting to new cashiering procedures, new um, application and business processes. Mm -hmm. Management of the various types of uh, post-go-live project maintenance um, is still taking up considerable time. In fact, we have over 100 change orders or SIRS as they're called in Breeze. Um, that we're currently working through right now. The time involved to request system fixes in terms of researching the problem, proposing a solution, and finally getting a change order in place has been significant over the past month and a half. DCA has provided the board with additional staff resources to help triage and capture the aforementioned changes. However, it is still a process, so we're still working through some of those post-go-live um, snafus, if you will. Notwithstanding the staff challenges, um, end users have taken well to the Breeze online system. Among the most sp the significant benefits are being able to renew your license online, also being able to file an application online, and having that immediate access to the business of the board. Um, the board does advise uh, our stakeholders and consumers of all of the availability of Breeze in many of our forms on our website, and we are directing all of our users to the Breeze system. The committee asked for some cost of the Breeze program in terms of ongoing impact to the board. The cost of the Breeze program implementation for the board is noted by DCA in uh, fiscal year, or current year, excuse me, 2015, 2016, was 275,000. For 1617, it's an anticipated cost of 264,000. And the ongoing maintenance costs, including staff costs for DCA and other program costs have not yet been identified at this time. As such, the board is uncertain of the ongoing impact to its uh, to the budget for this Breeze system. Chairman Sauce, uh, members of the committee, uh, staff, my name is David Johnson. I'm a registered veterinary technician and one of the members of the MDC committee for the veterinary board. I've been asked to address the issue that RVT issues still appear to be persisting and that there's a perception that the issues are also not being adequately addressed. The board agrees with staff that RVTs play a role, a very significant role and a necessary role in providing animal care services to the public's animals. Mm -hmm. Because of the role in providing these services, the Veterinary Medical Board and the multiple multidisciplinary committee place a great deal of importance on issues such as education, training, and the scope of the RVT responsibilities as they relate to consumer protection. Almost every practice issue reviewed and discussed by the MDC and the Veterinary Medical Board relates directly to RVTs as well as to veterinarians. As outlined in the Board's Sunset Supplemental Report, the MDC was originally created as a temporary committee in 2009 and was given specific enforcement issues to develop minimum standards, hospital inspection criteria, and deal with the issue of sight and fine. At that time, RVT issues were addressed by the Registered Veterinary Technician Committee. The Registered Technician Veterinary Committee was sunsetted in June of 2011, and the MDC became a permanent advisory committee to the Veterinary Medical Board. I joined the MDC in 2011. They were to assist the board with issues of the profession, including those issues that specifically relate to registered veterinary technicians. Because at that time, MDC was still working on its original mandates, the three previous ones that were mentioned, a two-member subcommittee was formed to address RVT issues, and I was placed and became a member of that subcommittee. 
At that same time, the Veterinary Medical Board had its own subcommittee to deal with registered veterinary technician issues. In 2013, the board asked its own two-member subcommittee to hold a task force meeting to discuss the issues of the transition to the national exam, to solicit public input on the RVT student exemption issue, and the issue of regulating RVT alternate route programs. It was decided that the two subcommittees, that of the MDC and that of the veterinary board, should work together on this task and hold meetings in conjunction with the MDC. The RVT task force held three public meetings in 2013, and based upon the input from those meetings, all pending RVT matters were then transferred to the MDC. Today, the composition of the MDC is nine members. One third of those members are registered veterinary technicians. One of those members is a member of the veterinary board and is a voting member, and one of the RVT's member is, is a member of the board and a voting member. The issues of, of that the MDC addresses are directly delegated by the veterinary board to the MDC. Section 4809.8 clearly expresses the legislature's intent that the MDC give appropriate consideration to issues pertaining to the practice of veterinary technicians. And this is exactly what the MDC has done for the last two years. A review of the past two years of meeting agendas and decisions by the board show that RVT issues have been given high priority. The MDC has examined each of the pending RVT issues, including RVT education and training, alternate route programs, and the RVT student exemption. Action has been taken by the board and by the MDC. In April of 2015, the MDC adopted recommendations regarding regulations for the California Veterinary Technology Alternate Route Program regulations. In July of 2015, the board approved a regulatory proposal that would establish program approval criteria for students enrolling in veterinary technology alternate route programs. In July of 2015, the MDC made regulatory recommendations to the board regarding the RVT student exemption matter, and this was an issue that was previously discussed by the subcommittees, and the board considered and approved language in October of 2015. To show the board's commitment to RVT issues, in the board's 2015 to 2019 strategic plan, there are specific objectives that relate to RVT issues. Uh, it has been d issued that there will be a complete cost analysis of the registered veterinary technician exam to determine reasonable and equitable fees. We've been asked to monitor and approve education and training offered by the RVT alternate route and programs to measure quality and consistency, and to address shelter minimum standards for RVT's roles in triaging and administering medical care to animals in a shelter environment. In addition to these above issues, the MDC has recently examined the RVT's role in drug compounding, animal rehabilitation, and is continuing its work as delegated by the board, determining the appropriate scope of autonomy for RVTs to practice. Two of the issues that are currently being addressed by the MDC, and they are two of the issues that I serve on subcommittees with, are how RVTs practice in a shelter medicine environment, and also are there extended functions that an RVT can perform in regards to offering veterinary services to the public's animals. The long delays cited in the background paper were delays both at the our RVTC and the MDC levels, and these delays occurred prior to 2014 when there was not significant staff to compile research, prepare memos, and facilitate the ongoing work of the committees. It was not due to a lack of priority, and it was not due to the board ignoring RVT issues. The board and the MDC have worked diligently to elevate and resolve many RVT matters and believe the current structure is working effectively and efficiently to address those issues. And I will add on a personal note that I became a animal health technician, which was the original title, in 1975. During the first Brown administration, I was the chairman and served on the Animal Health Technician Examining Committee, and I've been looking at issues in front of the veterinary board, both as a member of a committee or a member of a board, as well as just as a registered technician addressing issues to the board, and I've been monitoring the board for over 40 years now. Uh, I've worked with three different executive officers, and I can tell you that in that experience of mine, 
Each one of these executive officers has helped bring forth RVT issues and has helped set priorities on RVT issues as they have been brought forth to the board. Since 2014, I have seen a definite increase in prioritizing RVT issues. I've seen more support from the board, and I've seen better organization in the office with regards to compiling information on issues for the MDC. So I do believe that we are doing our job and that the issues of the RVTs are being addressed appropriately, both by the MDC and by the Veterinary Medical Board. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Paul gets thrown back to me. Um, issue number six, should veterinarians be granted authority to compound drugs for animal patients? When you or, or I receive a prescription from our doctors, we can go to the local pharmacy and have it filled. Um, but for many of the drugs that we use in veterinary medicines, those medicines just um, are not available or are not available in the right form or concentration. And so therefore the drugs need to be compounded by a compounding pharmacist or by a veterinarian. In October of 2015, uh, then legal counsel advised the board that there is no explicit grant of authority in the existing practice act that authorized veterinarians to compound drugs according to federal rule. Federal rule does, however, provide the foundation for states to adopt provisions for veterinarians to compound drugs. Under the following limitations, there is no approved animal or human drug available that is labeled for and in a concentration or form appropriate for treating the condition diagnosed. The compounding is, before, is performed by a licensed veterinarian uh, within the scope of a professional practice. Adequate measures are followed to ensure the safety and effectiveness of the compounded product. And the quantity of compounding is uh, commiserate with the established need of the identified patient. It's imperative for a veterinarian to be able to compound drugs for the safety of their animal patients in that many drugs are not available in concentrations that would be safe or effective for rodents, birds, reptiles, horses, herd animals, pocket pets, uh, or even very small dogs and cats. Historically, veterinarians have had to, be, have had to become very resourceful when it comes to delivering needed medicines to our patients. As some of you on the committee may know, if you have ever been asked to give a pill to your own cat. Uh, allowing veterinarians to continue to safely compound these drugs will allow us to remain resourceful and successful. The board has worked closely with the Board of Pharmacy this past year to develop a statutory proposal that is conservative in terms of its limited grant of authority and yet vital in terms of the health and safety of animals receiving veterinary care. The board is requesting the committee's assistance and support in carrying legislation to enact the necessary grant of authority, recognizes there is some fine tuning to the language that we need to address along with the Board of Pharmacy and other stakeholders. Okay, we're gonna move on to issue number nine and the use of antimicrobial drugs. And Chairman Hill, this is near and dear to your heart. It is, and thank you. You're welcome, we're gonna talk Very about much to you and the board for working so closely with, closely with us to what I think is a very successful outcome. And uh, now it's all in your hands, so. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, We've got really, partners in that, so. You do, that's true, but thank you shape. very, very much for I mean, your, You're welcome. your willingness to, to get your hands dirty around this issue and to really work hard on it is much appreciated. And I think the state is obviously a lot better off for it, so thank you. I think we appreciate your support as well. So uh, Senate Bill 27 is the mandate for developing antimicrobial stewardship guidelines and best practices. And that mandate was placed on the California Department of Food and Agriculture. And therefore the actual resource needs, at least up front, are on CDFA to identify. The board is one of the consulting agencies with CDFA to develop these um, best practices and these um, stewardship guidelines. And right now there is an ad hoc, um, it's actually called the Ad Hoc Technical Advisory Committee that's currently being, being formed by CDFA. And we expect to have a meeting in April with all of the stakeholders. Um, and that meeting is to discuss the plan and approach for developing monitoring systems or monitoring strategies, and also analyzing the legal impacts of Senate Bill 27 on CDFA's role in the oversight of retail veterinary drugs. So we are a partner in this effort. 
In terms of um, resources that we may need moving further from this initial development of the guidelines and best practices, so we may receive um, elevated or a number of complaints from the CDFA generated from veterinarians who prescribe a medically important antimicrobial drug to livestock that is not warranted for medical purposes. However, today it's too early to forecast uh, whether the volume will be such that the board needs additional staff resources. However, this is something on the board's radar and we will work closely with CDFA when it comes to that time. So I think we're talking about 2018. Thank you. Um, the other portion of this question has to do with Senate Bill 361. And that provision actually mandated a one hour course in the judicious use of medically important antimicrobial drugs every four years for all veterinarians, not just food animal veterinarians. And this is um, part of the uh, SB 27 implementation on stewardship and judicious use. However, there is some confusion, confusion about the phase in of this uh, requirement. Uh, the language itself says that on or after January 1st, 2018, a licensed veterinarian who renews his or her license shall complete. Um, so there was some confusion about whether or not the veterinarians would have to show proof of completion of this one hour course by their 2018 renewal or whether they have to start taking the course um, during their 2018 license cycle. Um, typically you see language that says beginning January 1st, 2018. So we are working closely with Senator Hill's office, the governor's office, the California Veterinary Medical Association to get some clarification on that implementation language. All of these groups kind of work together on SB 361. So I'm quite certain that we'll be able to work this out and we'll make sure that we notify the licensing population accordingly. Good, I think we all know Senator Hill and we'll follow up with him. <laughs> yeah, his staff is already on it. <laughs> That's true. Okay, let's move to issue 11. And that's the formal disciplinary process and it's still taking more than two years. And specifically you asked, are there any steps the board can take to reduce the time frame for taking formal disciplinary action? And I know this committee has heard from many other boards about things that are within the board's control and things that are outside the board's control. So I wanna talk about those things that are within the board's control, things that we can do to mitigate some of this time frame, and then give you a general understanding of what we see today in our enforcement program for formal discipline excuse me, formal discipline. Prior to 2015, um, man, the disciplinary cases linger, lingered uh, without timely resolution. And a large portion of that case aging had to do with the board's limited staffing in its enforcement unit. We had one full-time associate trying to manage over 80 cases at the AG's office. Um, in December of 2014, pursuant to a budget, budget augmentation, the board hired five additional staff in its enforcement unit and we began digging out of this backlog. It has taken the better part of a year to identify all of the aging cases as some merely were never closed out in the database and were still aging in the data system, while others were near resolution but were not finalized. The actual cleanup explains some of the more lengthy timeframes noted in the board's statistical data, which averaged cases taking almost 1,000 days in 2014-2015 to come to final resolution. In the same year, the board closed about 60 disciplinary cases, which is up from an average of 20 on an annual basis in years past. The board's made tremendous progress um, in reducing the timeframes for formal discipline. Having more staff in the board's disciplinary unit monitoring each stage of the case from transmittal to the Office of the Attorney General, to the filing of a pleading, requesting updates regarding the receipt of the respondent's notice of defense, checking on the status of any receipt of mitigation, scheduling mandatory settlement conferences, and scheduling formal hearings. Staff continues to monitor each, each case at all stages of the disciplinary process. Once a case is referred to the Office of the Attorney General, staff calendars a status check at 60 days and continues to make contact with the assigned Deputy Attorney General at regular intervals. The performance measure of 500 and, or excuse me, yeah, 540 days established by the Department of Consumer Affairs for formal discipline will continue to be a challenge. Current processing timelines gathered by the board reflect that on average from the date the board transmits a case to the Office of the Attorney General to the, to the time that a pleading is actually filed is between 100 and 150 days. From the date of referral to the AG's office, 
um, to the date of the actual hearing is on average 420 days. And these are all things I believe you are aware of as a committee and committee staff, but those things are beyond the board's control. They do, however, contribute to this measure of 540 days. Just those two steps in the process are beyond that measure. Another factor that affects the board's performance timeframes are case reassignments at the Office of the Attorney General. Recently, the board has had a number of cases reassigned, which delays the case and is an actual added expense to the board. So basically, we're paying for you know, two or three attorneys to review the same case. However, things are beginning to turn around. In the first two quarters of the fiscal year 15-16, 27 cases have already been closed with formal discipline, which means we're on track to close over 60 cases again this year. And while the average processing timelines have come down only about 60 days thus far, the board is confident that with the increased staff, the resolution of these older cases that had lingered with the board, and the partnership with our prosecutory arm, that being the Office of the Attorney General, we will continue to reduce the average case processing timelines for formal discipline. Thank you. Thank you. So that concludes our issues for this afternoon. We appreciate your time and your attention to all of these matters and we'll remain if there's any questions. Absolutely. I had a question for you. Yeah. Um, uh, do you want to start, Senator Hill, and then I can... I just have one question I wanted to ask related to the compounding drugs. And uh, does the proposed language address some of the current practices that uh, uh, veterinarians when they and in the compounding of drugs? They do, and I don't know if, did you want to speak to it, Mark? Okay, sorry. Um, the, the language does address some of the more common practices of veterinarians. That means um, we are looking at this kind of immediate use injectable compounded drugs that are used commonly in veterinary practice. Some of the labeling issues with compounding drugs don't completely translate from human medicine to veterinary medicine. So we have to work out some of those details with the Board of Pharmacy and the stakeholders, but we have identified what those issues are and we're confident that we can work through some of that to at least get this um, grant of authority that is needed in the state of California for veterinarians to serve their patients. Okay, very good, thank you. And just as a clarification on the, uh, the implementation or the starting of the classes, it was the intent that they start taking classes on January 1st of 18. So that means you. you, working with the governor's office, will work to try and make that clear. Absolutely, and we'll make it clear for our licensing population as well. I appreciate that clarification. Thank you. Thank you. I just had a couple of questions, and one, uh, we're talking about the fiscal uh, health, right, of the board, and so, to me, I was just looking at the numbers, and it seems like the board might be operating at a at a deficit. Um, without the new veterinary assistant permit fees, uh, the board projects it all would have no surplus by eighteen nineteen. Even with the new fees, the board appears to lose um, some of the on average like a half a month's reserve. If I if I'm reading the numbers correctly, and this isn't even factoring in the breeze program costs. So you know as a Board concerned about long-term financing, how do we maintain the health uh, even without the fees and with the fees and what does that do for just the health of the board as we move forward? Absolutely, it's something that the Department of Consumer Affairs and uh, board staff work on on a regular basis. We are aware that there is a fluctuation in the board's month and reserve, months in reserve and as Dr. Nunez mentioned, we need to stay between three and 10. And without knowing the volume of applications, I mean, we predict something like 13,000 new veterinary assistant controlled substances permits that may be administered or issued, excuse me, upon implementation of the new program. That will help secure a healthy fund balance. However, we are not completely sure what volume that's going to bring in. So it's something we are monitoring very closely. And in fiscal year 16, 17, we do have a plan to sit down with the department and look at what those revenues are bringing in thus far. And also by that point in time, we should know ongoing breeze costs, which will factor into that healthy fund balance. Uh, I'd be interested in seeing what the, those final numbers come out to be. We do wanna make sure that you are successful in moving forward. Appreciate that, um, thank you. I have another question that somebody had pointed out. It was an um, out-of-state consultant loophole, as some people have described it. And so, you know, the, I guess the language in the Business Profession Code 4830 was interpreted to mean a licensed out-of-state veterinarian could be called in one time by anyone and remain forever. 
Um, is this consistent with the board's interpretation of the statute? If not, does it believe uh, that there's an issue that needs to be solved through, do we need to change it statutorily? Yes, thank you, Chairman Solis. Um, we do recognize that there is an issue and it actually came up uh, with a particular enforcement case um, a few years back and mm -hmm. a district attorney actually ruled that the language was a little ambiguous in that it appeared that anyone could call in a veterinarian from out of state, not just a licensed veterinarian in California for consultation purposes. And in this particular state, uh, this particular case, a veterinarian was called, a veterinarian initially called in another veterinarian from out of state. That veterinarian came and assisted on a case and then remained in the state unlicensed and continued to see patients. So clearly that's a case of unlicensed activity. We have not been able to vet that individual to make sure they meet the entry licensing qualifications in the state of California. And if in fact a district attorney read the statute that way, there is obviously areas of confusion and we don't want to encourage or support unlicensed activity in the state of California. So the board is aware of that particular problem and um, has actually been approached by the California Veterinary Medical Association to resolve this issue. We are supportive in moving that forward. So yeah. As you continue to move forward, let us know if that's something we also need to clarify in statute, uh, just so that we are all clear. We would appreciate if the committee is agreeable to that, to see some, some language to help us kind of close that loophole in the, in the, in the Practice Act. Okay. And we'll work with you and your staff to ensure that that language does in fact that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just one more question we had touched upon earlier, animal rehabilitation. And so uh, just wanted to know what the VMB's current position on the issue of whether uh, animal rehabilitation falls under the practice of veterinary medicine or have we gotten a legal opinion on that? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, at this point, we've had counsel look at the issue of whether animal rehabilitation is in fact the practice of veterinary medicine. And I think that um, the board is, feels very secure in the fact that if you're using animal rehabilitation as a means to deal with a medical issue, so you're treating some sort of ailment, disease, um, prevention of a disease, and it's not just a wellness modality, that that would in fact be covered under the Veterinary Medical Practice Act. Um, however, we recognize that this is such a very broad and complex issue and that there are a number of individuals that uh, participate in some area of rehabilitation in that spectrum that we really need to take a, a more thorough look at how to regulate this. Um, the bottom line is we need to come from a place of consumer protection and that's the board's role. This isn't about protectionism. This is about what does the consumer need? What does the consumer deserve in terms of competence, training, skill, and what are they trying to address in this rehabilitation realm um, and so we are working closely with some of the stakeholders and we know the committee has suggested that we form a task force, a broader task force of individuals that work in this area of practice to try and come to some sort of agreement on what is a good model of regulating animal rehabilitation in the state of California. And there are already several states that regulate animal rehabilitation in some fashion. Um, there's varying levels of supervision, varying degrees of education involved. Um, so it, it, there are many models out there, but I don't think there is one consistent model. And we need to do what works best for California given how diverse the state is and the number of individuals that are currently involved in this area. Okay. If, if I can add to that, some Please. other issues that were talked about is we don't really have a clear definition of exactly what is uh, rehabilitation, there's so many um, treatments out there. And uh, we also had some discussion on um, where it can be performed, um, premise locations and so forth. Okay, well thank you. Look forward to actually seeing your work and whether you form a task force. Um, as Senator Hill could probably attest to, we have lots of folks coming into our offices. <laughs> um, yeah, and this is one of the, the issues of topic. It certainly is. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Additional questions, comments from members of the dais? Okay. Hearing and seeing none, let me s Are you sure? Oh. You look like it's right there. <laughs> Senator Wykowski. <laughs> okay. So, 
Thank you for your testimony. Let's go ahead and bring up the uh, professional groups, organizations, and individuals, please.